breaking tonight. The Baltimore City Comptroller's office has been advised to stop shredding documents while the office is under federal investigation. According to an email reviewed by Fox 45 News, a former employee of Comptroller Joan Pratt has been shredding documents at City Hall, and the city's law department is advising that the shredding should stop. The U.S. Department of Labor is currently investigating Pratt's office, and the city's record retention policy requires elected offices to receive permission from the state archivist before destroying documents. Comptroller Joan Pratt is no stranger to conflicts. A Fox 45 News investigation tracked her for two weeks and found she spent an average of only 18 hours a week at City Hall. Pratt insisted she was working remotely. Now, Baltimore's inspector general found Pratt voted 30 times in three years to award lucrative city contracts, grants, and pre-qualifications to companies which appeared to be conflicts of interest, including a vote that awarded her church, Bethel AME, a sweetheart land deal. Now, she she also came under fire when she accepted a campaign contribution from developer J.P. Grant. That's the same developer who Pratt voted to award millions in city contracts. And then there is also a boutique that Joan Pratt used to own with now convicted former mayor Catherine Pugh. Prosecutors say she filed a false tax return for the boutique. A Baltimore motorist under attack by squeegee workers at a midtown intersection. Video from her dash cam shows exactly what happened when she pulled to the intersection of Martin Luther King and Chase Streets. The driver tells us tonight she was approached by squeegee workers and when she waved them off, they began shattering her window and pelting her vehicle with rocks. She spoke with us on the phone a few moments ago. Throw rocks at my car because I didn't want to give them no money? Then I, uh, one really scared. I was just mad. Just something they need to do something about these squeegee boys in this city. It's getting to be ridiculous. It's going to get to the point where somebody's seriously going to get hurt or God forbid killed. And I know the police have more important things to deal with with all these murders going on with the city, but something needs to be done. If they would have done this, something about this when they first started doing it, nip it in the bud when it first started, maybe it wouldn't have escalated because I know other people's vehicles have been damaged as well. The driver escaped uninjured, but she is still totaling the damage to her vehicle. Well, for at least a year now, Fox 45 has been closely monitoring trash and illegal dumping issues in Baltimore. And like this alley, North Longwood Street in West Baltimore, which for the past two months has been turned into an illegal dumping ground. Yesterday, a bulldozer and few rolling dumpsters from the Department of Public Works arrived to clean up the area. Baltimore City's trash issues are a well-documented problem with streets sweeping and other services on hold during the pandemic. Neighbors in East Baltimore noticed a litter starting to pile up. Well, that's when they got to work, and Shelley Orman shows us how kids are now leading the charge to clean it all up. Hey, Saturday mornings in East Baltimore have taken on a bit of a new routine. We cover about a five block area from Chester Street all the way to Monfort, maybe sometimes Milton. This is now a regular sight, bright and early each Saturday morning. It's been good, 15 weeks strong now, this is week 15. About a dozen kids from the neighborhood. Hey Mick, you need a bag. Like 15 year old Mick are up, gloves on, trash bags in hand, hard at work, all before 8 a.m. When we first started, it was way more dirty than this. But now, since we clean it up for real, it's getting less and less dirty every week. Thanks to their hard work, the Baltimore Clean Streets program is making a noticeable difference. We clean the same area each week, and um, you know we, we really just try to make a consistent impact in a set area. Munir Bahar pays kids $10 an hour. The money is what first brought Mick out to work. When I first started, I wasn't really worried about trying to make a difference in the community for real. But that's not what's kept him coming back each week. But now that I see every week the community getting cleaner and cleaner, it's like, dang, we really changing it. They could do other things for money, you know, but they choose to come out early on a Saturday morning at 745. Kids changing their neighborhood. We got to keep our community clean because without us, ain't nobody else cleaning it up for real. But maybe changing even more than that. To see them engaged in something structured, consistent, positive each week is, uh, I think, is just providing hope for the rest of the neighborhood that, you know, that the change is there. It's tangible. One weekend at a time. On July 1st, Ricky Walker Jr. pulled a weapon on police. 
He was cornered in the basement of his in-laws home at the time. Outside the row home for about 20 minutes, medics waited for Walker to come up. Police were downstairs trying to convince him to come up and see medics. Instead, he pulled a weapon and police reacted. Tonight, we investigate whether detectives consulted the city state's attorney's office before charging Walker and why Walker was even in possession of a firearm. Last time they gave him two shots of whatever you gave him. That last time was about 10 days before this call and it too required police and medics to respond. What this officer doesn't know is during that incident that happened about 10 days earlier, Ricky Walker Jr. was not only combative, he was armed and shooting at cars. The officer also doesn't know how many weapons Walker still possesses. What he does know is Walker is cornered and agitated. So you feel like you hurt yourself? Lie, yo. No, hell no. You don't want I'm to in my own house, yo. You about to kill me. He about to please save my life. They think they're smarter than me. Nobody's still trying, trying to, play to kill you, man. As two other officers arrive, I'm honest, man, yo. and they begin to get closer I'm to honest. Walker. How you doing, buddy? Walker, who has a weapon in I'm each honest. of his pockets, begins to throw out threats. You're inside my house. And if I kill you inside my house, yo, it's legal, yo. You want to die inside my house, yo? Nobody's not I'm trying to home. die. I don't have any. I'm peaceful. Okay, He's if you're peaceful, me, let's go upstairs. Roughly 20 minutes go by before this happens. Attics are outside. Walker pulling out a weapon and pointing it at police. Online court records now show Ricky Walker Jr. facing felony charges. Included in the charges, assault and use of a firearm in commission of a violent crime. Sources close to the investigation tell me the city state's attorney's office was consulted and knew the charges were coming. In this case, we, we had to send in police because the medics and para, the paramedics and EMTs could not and did not go in until we rendered it safe for them to do so. For 30 days, Baltimore City State's Attorney Marilyn Mosby's office let those charges stand until this week when prosecutors dropped the charges. In the City State's Attorney's statement, a spokeswoman writes in part, the charges against Mr. Walker were filed by the Baltimore Police Department without consultation with our office. The Baltimore Police Department wrote in an email, we do consult with the state's attorney's office on many cases prior to filing charges. While charges against Walker have been dismissed, the officers who injured him have yet to learn their fate. Marilyn Mosby's office has yet to determine whether this shooting was justified. A shooting that our investigation found could have been avoided had officers who initially encountered Walker shooting at cars followed Maryland's red flag law. Under it, members of law enforcement can request from a judge an extreme risk protective order. Elizabeth Benash, who is the executive director of Marylanders to Prevent Gun Violence, says it's cases like Walker's the law aims to address. There was clear evidence that that individual um, exhibited behavior uh, that would indicate that he was not someone who should be in possession of a gun. And that would be a clear indication that the police would have um, at least the responsibility to pursue that with a judge and to have the judge help decide whether or not the gun should be removed from the person's house. In Walker's in-law's home, police say they found registered firearms that belonged to Walker and unregistered ones. Since Maryland's red flag law took effect in October 2018, we found that no other jurisdiction has requested more extreme risk protective orders than Anne Arundel County with 321. At the end of July, Baltimore County had recorded 269. Baltimore City, meanwhile, had requested 73. We're told Walker remains in the hospital. Although charges against him have been dismissed, the city state's attorney's office still has the authority to refile those charges. Maddox are outside. Should the office choose to. 
Police found about eight weapons inside Walker's in-laws row home. You may be wondering, where are they now? I'm told they're still with police. If there's a story involving public safety you'd like us to investigate, we want to hear about it. You can call us at 410-662-1456, or you can send us an email to crimeandjustice at foxbaltimore.com. I'm Joy LaPola, and this is Operation Crime and Justice.